Yeah, welcome everybody. Where are you? Uh, and hope you're doing well um, uh, during these difficult times. Um, it's a little bit like results day at school today, but uh, as well about the question about what kind of job do we have in the future? And uh, this is what I'm going to talk about. And it's a pleasure that you are spending the time with us today. Um, I have to admit, you know, it's an easy one because it's my fourth Capital Markets Day. And looking hindsight, I'm very happy about, let's say, how we performed over the last uh, uh, three years um, and uh, looking at the results we have achieved. And uh, this is due to an outstanding team in this industry. I think to an outstanding strategy of very focused, you know, an approach of delivering of what we have promised and even, you know, sticking out to the others in this industry and outperforming them as well from a capital market perspective. And that leads me already to my first slide, which is, you know, the full Monty of all the messages in a nutshell. And for the ones who don't have time or want to do their sports in the afternoon or who want to, let's say, hang out with other companies, here we go, just digest this slide. With this, you got it all. This is, by the way, you know, how we are looking into the future. And that is built on two pillars. The one is the organic pillar, is the way how we operate in our telecommunication industries. But the second pillar is at least as um, the same importance, which is the way how, the, how we think, how we allocate money, and the way how we are organizing the portfolio um, uh, which we are running. And this all is resulting in the commitments which we are giving for the future. Now, this is what we're doing already for quite some time. And this is our so-called flying wheel. Uh, and the flying wheel is very simple. On the one side, we always invest more than our competition. This is the idea, a little bit better, a little bit um, 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 higher uh, from, a, from a quality perspective, which on the other side gives us the opportunity to gain more customers. Gaining more customers on the infrastructure will help us to create higher efficiency, which means the productivity of our network is higher than the ones from our competition. And the higher efficiency plus more customers is as a consequence, resulting in more profitability in higher financials. And the higher financials made us able to go into further investments, which is helping us to outperform the competition. To give you just a number, since I'm CEO, I've invested 85 billion without Spectrum into this, into this flying wheel. This is, by the way, 37 billion more than what Vodafone invested, 37 more than what Orange invested, and 27 billion more than what Telefonica has invested. And this is, by the way, at the end of the day, this is the consequence why we are doing better than the others. Going forward, we are accelerating. And if you would ask me today, what is the headline of our capital market strategy? It's acceleration. It's acceleration. We have a sound foundation and now we accelerate on the KPIs. There is a revenue CAGR of 1% to 2%. Looks like the other one which we had previous one, but behind that is a revenue growth, a service revenue growth of 3 to 4% commitment which we foresee. Our profitability is going to increase by 3 to 5%. So this is more than what we were able to deliver on last time. So we are very confident that we can accelerate on the profitability of that company. The last time we were talking about 8 billion free cash flow for this group as our ambition level. Now we are handing out a commitment of 18 billion as the minimum which we foresee for our 2024 ambitions. And on top of that, we even want to be leading, more leading on the capital returns which we are delivering on our network. So you know that the ROSI is one of our core KPIs, it always works. It was Deutsche Telekom, by the way, uh, bringing it into the uh, um, um, telecommunication industries. And now we are achieving and we are aiming for 6.5% return on capital employed as a minimum for the foreseeable future at Deutsche Telekom's uh, infrastructure. This is the organic roof and the flying wheel which we foresee. 
On top of that, the capital allocation is for us very important. It always was. If we cannot live with only the organic growth, we have to find ways to generate value outside or within the portfolio. The first thing what we are doing is we invest more to be leading in 5G across the globe, the transatlantic, transatlantic position which we hold. And we're going to be the number one in fiber investment in the European footprint. This is something where Dominic and uh, Srini will talk about. On top of that, network is nice, but monetization is the must if you invest this amount of billions into the infrastructure. The second topic is focus on structurally healthy markets. For us, a very important thing. If we are, do not find a market which is structurally in order, if we find a market which is over-regulated, over-competitive, we are even willing to leave that market. We did that already in the past. Think about Albania, think about Romania and other markets. But this is a clear commitment that we do not find an impossible game, uh, game. So therefore, we are trying to focus on fixing a structural issue. And if we can't, we are even willing to exit markets. On top of that, maybe the biggest news for today, we are clearly committing to get the majority in the US within the time frame uh, which we have laid out. Our voting proxies will expire in 2024. But until then, we will make sure that we have a clear ownership of 50% and above in the US environment. The US is part of our story, is part of our, uh, of our footprint. We are the transatlantic leader in the telco uh, markets. On top of that, we commit to deleverage the company uh, into the investment grade commitments, um, which we have always laid out in the, uh, in the last capital markets. This is due to the merger and the integration costs that we are out of it in the US right now, but we will come back into this corridor soon. And that is another commitment which we are giving. And on top of that, we have waited and we have looked, we have improved the profitability of our Dutch business. We have restructured the market. Uh, we found partners with Tele2. We have integrated the simple business. Now it's the time after this super value accretion to think about what is the best way to monetize our asset in the Netherlands. That doesn't mean we have to do that to the, the other stuff. It's an add-on which we see to optimize uh, our overall portfolio. But we will move into the market with this asset right now, checking out what is the best way on the Dutch side. And we have improved our profitability on the tower side as well. We have taken the European towers out of the business as well. And we will work on monetizing towers as well in the upcoming future. And we will talk about that later on, how we're going to do that, what kind of scenarios we foresee, and why it's now the right timing. It's a kingmaker asset which we have on hand. And I think, we think, with the current multiples, the current valuations we see in the markets, now it's the right time to understand, you know, what we can do with this asset in the best manner. These two pillars result into outstanding profitability. And uh, to be very clear, our focus is not anymore to compare ourselves with Vodafone, Orange or Telefonica. They are anyhow focusing on free cash flow and other KPIs. Our industry, fast moving consumer goods. This is areas like Henkel and, and others who are delivering constant earning per shares increases in their business. And that's the peer group which we wanna, uh, where we want to benchmark ourselves. And therefore, we have changed our logic from a free cash flow logic, a full consolidated free cash flow number, which doesn't give you an indication about what we are able um, to uh, contribute to the community. But we are now focusing on the earnings per share as the main KPI. And we will increase our earnings per share from 1 euro 10 to above 1 euro 75 in the upcoming three years. This is then the basis for the dividend accretion you will get from Deutsche Telekom. And the basis of that one is that we are willing to contribute 
between 40 and 60 percent of the adjusted earnings per shares into your direction. This is, by the way, if you benchmark yourself with other industries, I think this is a very fair value contribution. And on top of that, it gives us a leeway to further increase the dividends of Deutsche Telekom in the upcoming years. That said, we know that you need a floor. You need a kind of interest rate for the huge investments uh, you have taken with us on that journey. And therefore, we guarantee a floor of 60 cents as a maple. This is the storylining of our Capital Markets Day today. Now, quickly going into a review, and I know you know our numbers, but you know, we are proud about what we have achieved. Um, and uh, therefore, this is not an accident. I think it was the consequence of our very focused strategy. We didn't change our strategy over the last years. We amended it here and there, but in principle, we, we kept pace on one direction, and that made us strong. We didn't deviate, we didn't expand it outside of our footprint. We didn't make adventures you know, uh, into the, uh, the over-the-top business models, nor we did it into the content world. We really focused on our network technology as the centerpiece of what we had. We focused on the convergence, which was for us really a big gain of revenue uh, in the past. Um, and we were very much focusing on the IP migration and the digitization of our service so far. This based into outstanding service capabilities plus a business class which is where we enable our customers to digitize their service around the connectivity piece. Reducing the cost, we overachieved our cost a commitment from the last Capital Markets Day and we simplified, digitized and accelerated um, our um, uh, services uh, within the company. Now, these are, in a nutshell, the numbers. We grow on both sides of the Atlantic. 3% on a CAGR in Europe, 9% on an organic CAGR in the US. So all the business are in growth mode. We invested a lot in sustainable growth momentum. And you see that René Obermann, you know, he was investing in Germany 3.3 to 3.6 billion. We changed that immediately and we have invested around 5 billion, 5.5 billion in the vicinity of, in the uh, um, area of Germany alone, 7.5 on a European space. And we have constantly grown this to gain um, uh, an advantage uh, uh, towards our competition. And on top of that, we had the US investments into a leading mobile infrastructure. These two years are reflecting the merger integration. Perspectively, this will shrink, but the integration cost is worth doing. Our free cash flow at the same time were even able to grow from 5.5 billion to 6.3, including the merger costs here, or 8 billion um, uh, if uh, you look forward to our guidance which we have laid out. So a great story going forward, but now we go from 8 billion to 18 billion. With this, we were able to perform better on infrastructure than our competition. And this is the outcome of it. We gain market share in every region where we are operating. We grown in Germany by 2.4% on mobile postpaid customers, 1.8% in the European region, 29% in the US and in the Netherlands by 25%. So wherever we were able to invest, we were able to gain new customer momentum, with, um, which was the basis for the growth we were able to show. The US yes story is well aware to everybody here um, in this uh, audience. We have more than 100 million customers on branded services. We have a market cap of 165 billion. By the way, we increased our value seven times um, over the last you know, uh, four years. 68.4 billion of revenues and an outstanding position uh, especially of the mid-band um, spectrum. And the value creation um, is, you know, um, I think the biggest value creation ever seen in a merger in the telecommunication history 
um, uh, at Deutsche Telekom. Going forward, I think there is more uh, to, to understand what is driving us. And the first thing is, you know, cleaning the garage. And I like to start, and you maybe have already forgotten that, we had a 9.6 billion arbitration risk coming from the toll collect, something we inherited uh, from the history. We were able to settle that for a cost of 550 million, done. We divested Telecom Albania, and we even divested our fixed line business in Romia, uh, Romania, markets where we believe structurally we had no way uh, to win prospectively. We have created new growth areas with the fixed mobile integration of our Liberty business in Austria, um, a 1.8 billion cash acquisition, but we are ahead of the synergies, we are ahead of our uh, um, uh, market shares in this region, so I can call this merger already a success today. Turn around in the Netherlands, an outstanding story we are faced by integrating um, our partner Tele2 with a share deal into our, um, into our business, consolidating Simple um, uh, over the last years, creating a new uncarrier momentum in the market with a market share gain never seen before. This business has more than doubled its position since the difficult times uh, when we started. And we carefully separated our tower business, not only in Germany, but as well in the, um, in the European operations. And we built a company which has 55,000 towers um, and is by definition the second biggest tower company in Europe. We are the kingmaker because everybody is putting his chess figures on the game, but nobody has so far consolidated in these industries. With us, somebody can really create the winner. And on top of that, we have managed um, the Dutch portfolio um, together with Cellnex, which gives us a leeway to create money outside of the balance sheet for infrastructure investments for Europe. We said no, and maybe saying no is more important to all the good stories which I just has crafted. Because to stay focused was very important. And there were a lot of, let's say, kind of things which, which sounded attractive. You know, Verizon went into their adventure with Yahoo and the like. Um, AT&T went into their adventure with, media, uh, uh, with Warner Media and the like. Telefonica went into a three billion investment for football rights for three years, and so on and so on. We said no to all of this outside business um, opportunities where most of the people lost billions. We stayed focused on our connectivity plus strategy. And I think this is what we call put your money where your mouth is than rather trying to build empires. Now, this is the consequence of all of this. Revenue grow from 75 billion to more than 109 billion of today. This is a CAGR organically of 3% but it's overall a growth of 10%. We grew our EBITDA by 14% organically by 6%. And we grew our cash flow by organically 14%, 10% overall. These are all targets. Uh, these are all achievements which were higher than our originally committed targets, which we laid out at our last Capital Markets Day. And thank you for that, guys. Uh, you gave us a higher multiple. You contributed more trust into us over the past. Uh, we highly appreciate that. And we know that our multiples are a, a little bit higher than to the others. We have created 40.5% 40, 40 more value, while um, Telefonica, Orange, and Vodafone, they all lost market cap during this season. So this is, I think, for me, the biggest outcome. And if you look to the numbers, I was just reading them up, you know, um, before I came down here. Since I'm a CEO, we have created 84% 84 accretion, which is a total value of 46 billion. While at the same time, 
Vodafone lost 13.4% and Telefonica lost 50.6%. So I think, you know, when it comes to results day, I feel pretty okay. -ish. But the problem with the results day is, you know, nothing is guaranteed. And the more results you have, the bigger the risk is you fail. So therefore, I think we have to move on with the changes we are doing. And this is already part of the journey which we have started. Our teams are working agile now. We are much more digital than we ever were. 30% of our workforce of today is already um, working in an agile environment. 300 scrum masters and product owners uh, running these projects. We became very diverse and international over the time. I'm not talking about our board, which has 40% you know, women ratio. Oh, my board here around my team, which is executive, where we have um, not only 30% women ratio, but even we have four nationalities. We are quite diverse in the way how we are organizing ourselves. More than 25% of all the new hires in Germany are international people. So this company really became an international footprint, trying to create best breed of the world. Remember last time I said, we want to be like FC Bayern Munich. We want to have, let's say, a very solid German foundation about our German engineering piece, but we want to allocate a lot of international people, the best players of the world, into our team to play Champions League. Catching the youngsters. We have started new um, advertising campaigns with Billie Eilish and others because, you know, the customer of today might not be the customer of the future. And there will be a next generation coming who should appreciate our brand the same way um, as the others are doing. We have created a big footprint around sustainability and about ethical standards, and we have a very strong strong stand in the political arena, especially in Europe, where we are hurt with the needs. And I think this is very important and we go into that one even beyond, more. And the last one is for me the most important piece. It's something you never see. You always see the CEO, you see Christian, you see some of the board members and you think you understand the company. Sorry guys, you don't. You only understand the company if you're going down to earth, going down into the operations of these people. If you're going down to the service people who are going out to the customers on a single day. If you go into our shops, if you go down into the organizational piece, these are the, the drivers of the change and the transformation of our company. And we were able to change the thinking, the way how they act, the way how they, they constantly perform into one direction significantly over the last years. 85% of our employees say we like to work for Deutsche Telekom. More than 80% of the people say we recommend Deutsche Telekom as an employer. More than 80% think our brand um, uh, is something um, uh, uh, unique. And we have just, you know, a lot of grassroots initiatives in these companies. 200 brand ambassadors. They're just sitting there and always communicating about magenta, talking about tea and talking about our products. Think about if 200,000 people constantly are proud about what they're doing. Think about the momentum they can create with other customers. This gives confidence to customers if the employers believe in what we are doing. We have green pioneers all over the companies who are caring about sustainability on the shop floor. And we have a lot of agile activities. Think about design thinking. I never asked for design thinking that company, but suddenly it grew like mushrooms everywhere, design thinking teams on creating a new way uh, for developing products and services. So this is, I think, even stronger than all, let's say, the strategic elements which I just described. Now, this is the outcome. These were the commitments. This is, let's say, what we achieved. Please have a look to this one. And I can tell you they're almost all green. I put two on yellow because, you know, the merger costs and the dividend commitment which we have given were a little bit higher. But we said if we are 
digesting this super merger with Sprint. We couldn't plan that. It was unforeseeable whether we deliver on it. You know, we, we had to cut it, you know, to the 60 cents, by the way, which is more than the 50 cents we said uh, originally. But this is at least the only thing where I think we have not delivered or over-delivered over the promises of our last Capital Markets Day. This brings me to a totally different topic. If you're grabbing scent and trying to keep it in your hand, it will disappear. You cannot hold it. It will get less and less and less. So you constantly have to grab and grab and grab new scent. This industry is changing dramatically. As an industry, telcos are at the center of the tsunami. The industry is expecting that our industry is accelerating as well. And on top of that, this landscape is changing dramatically when it comes to the players which are new in the field of telecommunication service. Just think about the over-the-top players. Just think about um, the, uh, the service providers who are changing their business models. And I want to spend a little bit more time not talking about the next Horizon 1 issue. I just want to talk with you a little bit, what is our vision for 2030? How does Deutsche Telekom might look like in 2030? How can Deutsche Telekom be successful in 2030, knowing that this is still a long way to go? But we have to prepare the future now if we don't want to miss it on a long-term perspective. And I think we are more and more talking about the next quarter, but we should always keep in mind why are we doing things. And therefore, let me deep dive a little bit into a long-term perspective. Welcome to 2030. Everything is connected. Humans, things, the entire world. Our ways of living will change. People know that their behavior in the next 15 years will decide what the world in 100 years will look like. Consumer behavior and business conduct will change. People will more and more shop on their beliefs and values, and saving the planet might become the top purchase criteria. Sharing will be the new owning, as access to things like cars or houses will matter more than ownership, and companies will change their value chains to reflect this. Technology will be omnipresent. The digital and real world will begin to merge into one. Physical objects and processes in a manufacturing plant will be replicated into a digital twin. Going to the office might mean putting on your VR glasses. Spatial computing and smart surroundings begin to supplant smartphones. Driving a car by yourself could begin to look strange. And all that has one common denominator. It's enabled by us by connectivity, the new oxygen in 2030. Connectivity is now a human right and determines our communication behavior. You are going to be the ones which breach the digital divide. Technological development now needs to be more value-based. We have a responsibility to implement ethics in technologies and make them available to everyone. This wild west in the internet has to get regulated. People will judge companies more on their purposeful, on their ethical behavior. In everything we develop and create, it must always be about the human being, the individual, across generations. There will be a digital identity for each of us. We need it for being authorized. We need it even for buying things on the network. In 2030, products are even more customized to the individual. The technology around us knows our preferences. Our digital identity unfolds new possibilities, but also offers more room for surveillance. A variety of different networks will coordinate comprehensive connectivity. At the same time, the requirements for connectivity have changed. We have a huge customer base where the demand for high-speed data and large volumes of data is growing and is growing really, really fast. We have the ability to serve their needs, building a high quality fiber and 5G network. For global and universal connectivity at all times, all networks are interconnected. This network of networks needs to be orchestrated. 
We have to start today and not rest on our achievements of the recent years. It's time to build, to stay leading. I think we have a good attitude, we have a lot of self-confidence in what we're doing. And from this we have a good starting point to do the things in the right way. But it's time to build something new. It's time that we are thinking about the future we want to leave behind for the next generation. So talking about 2030, one is for sure clear. Connectivity is a human right. Connectivity is expected everywhere. And therefore, Deutsche Telekom's business is at the centerpiece of this, of this expectation. Now, I cannot give you all, let's say, elements of what we foresee um, as uh, trends in this, in, in this environment. And therefore, I'm trying to reduce it to five major trends which we have to anticipate if we think about a successful telecom business in the future. And I like to separate into the B2C, the B2B area, into the ESG and the purpose issue around the network and about the services which uh, we have to deliver in this regard. Now, the first paradigm is we will go from a pure connectivity provider, even in a siloed way, into somebody who is enabling different customer use cases with different connectivity pieces. On the B2B side, we will go from dedicated services like MPLS, like voice, into more software-driven enterprise solutions with embedded connectivity. In the ESG world, we will face customers choosing, let's say, products and brands with their feet from a kind of ESG as a hygiene factor to companies who are able to differentiate with ESG criteria. We will deliver and we will see network of networks. So there will be the monolithic incumbent who's providing all kinds of connectivities today. He will he will in the future be an orchestrator of infrastructures, even from third parties. And what we see, we will see a softwareization of the networks in the way how they are organized. They will be disaggregated, they will be um, cloud-based, cloud-native, and microservices will enable different use cases in these environments. And the prerequisites have to be organized. Um, it will not be any kind of vertical silo as a telco operator is working today. Let's go a little bit deeper into this storyline. Connectivity everywhere is something which is obvious to us, especially after this corona crisis. And we will have a mobile world and we will have a kind of stationary world in our offices and in our, uh, in our um, uh, uh, living environments. There will be all kinds of devices which has to get connected to the infrastructure. And there will be at home all the kind of connectivities, a lot of data flow in the home environment which has to get organized in a kind of service way. Data streams, customer ID, this all has to be organized in a way that it's working, functioning and is affordable for the clients. A mesh router, for instance, is already a centerpiece for your home living where all the different devices might get easily get connected. On top of that, there will be new forms of connectivity. We call that embedded connectivity. The principle is always the same, always best connected. So wherever you are, independent, whether Deutsche Telekom is there with their own infrastructure, yes or no, we have to make sure that customers are always best connected. We buy it, we use it, we integrate it, and it should be always super secure. If it's not secure, we get the blame for that one. And it has to be modular, because customers don't want to buy the super, super, super product. They want to buy a tailored product which is fitting to the needs of the specific use case they are um, organizing. 
take the consumer IoT world. You do not want to buy a global connectivity for voice if you just need an IoT device. Think about mobile gaming. You need low latencies in specific. You do not need the full-fledged service. Or take the 8K conference systems, which we are all witnessing during these times, more or less 4K today, but 8K conferences will have a huge data demand in a stationary use case. And we have to tailor the infrastructure in a way that we can monetize this different service in a kind of context-aware way, but as well in a kind of dynamic uh, way, because customers don't want to have the service forever for a 24-month contract. They want to have it when they're using the infrastructure. This always best connectivity means tailored connectivity. And that is something which we foresee in the future. Services everywhere and um, embedded connectivity, context aware and dynamic. On the B2V front, we will go away from the classical siloed approach. We deliver a voice service for B2B customers. We de de deliver a data service. We have messaging services. This connectivity piece will get embedded into UC or enterprise communication and collaboration tools. We call that ECC. So you will buy maybe your Microsoft package with an embedded connectivity already in the future. And this requires a lot of changes in the way how we organize, but even if we sell connectivity um, in the communication piece. Security today is a firewall which is covering connectivity on an end-to-end -end basis in the network. In the future, we see that zero trust networks, secure access service edge networks, will deliver every application in a different security functionality. This is a big expectation towards telcos to organize that all different elements of a data use in the business environment is um, uh, uh, protected in a special way. And what we're going to see in the mobile space in specific is we will see dedicated network slices. Interesting wise, nobody's talking any about, um, about the network slicing, but 5G was always the biggest advantage of it, apart from the bandwidth, was always the capability of slicing in a dynamic way parts of that infrastructure. And we foresee that for the different use cases in IoT, um, in the B2B space, that we are able to deliver sliced infrastructure for these customers going forward. This creates new opportunities of growth for telecom operators if you differentiate not between one or two products, but between a variety of use cases in this telecommunication space. The third one is ESG. And by the way, um, we have started with ESG maybe a little bit late, I have to admit. But you know, as we learned how important it gets for our customers. Today, already 46% of customers, we know they're looking how purposeful and how re reliable and how um, uh, uh, consequent a company is acting in, um, a society, in their societal behavior. And therefore, companies will definitely be chosen be, uh, by the way how, uh, how they adapt to the social norms uh, going forward. There will be a significant issue coming from the CO2 um, uh, um, emission reduction, um, which our industry is creating and, by the way, is able to, um, to reduce. Low carbon economy, um, the question about our value chains um, and supply chains um, is something which is very important. And Deutsche, uh, the telecom operators are the ones who are helping all other industries to be more efficient. Think about an autonomous car. By the way, one terabyte of data within eight hours of an autonomous car is being generated over the infrastructure. 
We have to manage that. Think about car sharing. Think about the capability of collaboration tools, less travel. Think about the cloud of the, especially the mid-sized companies who are not in the cloud environment already today. These companies can save significant CO2 emission um, by just using telecommunication services. So the telecom operator is the biggest enabler for um, the CO2 emission in the digital world. And the factor which is um, calculated for that one is one to seven um, uh, um, CO2 reduction um, through telecommunication service in the upcoming future. So we are at the center of this ESG movement if we are driving it right and if we are driving it in a way that we are um, accepted. The fourth development is the network. And the network, and I have to maybe um, disappoint you, don't believe that the consolidation and the consolidation is bringing this industry to less networks. Uh, we foresee significantly more networks in the future. We foresee a much higher complexity in the network and the ownerships of these networks going forward than it is today. So there will be a multifold of a different infrastructure who is providing this new connectivity which is required from the customers on all angles. There will be a physical infrastructure which is coming from satellites, it will come from multi-regional fiber cores like um, uh, uh, City Fiber or KKR here in Germany. There will be the local fiber cores who are providing infrastructure, take the net colognes or others. There will be alternative networks like uh, Amazon uh, uh, Mesh Network, Kuiper, there will be Sidewalk, Take Georion, another Wi-Fi network, mesh infrastructures, which are providing connectivities, especially in dense areas. There will be campus networks, which are existing in the shop floor of big manufacturing plants or ports or other uh, uh, equations. So spectrum being used for, um, for dedicated infrastructures and there will be even some kind of wholesale businesses who are providing um, specific services in the IoT case or tower cores who are providing just infrastructure, passive infrastructure in the ecosystem. Now think for a moment, now you can compete and trying, okay, we are better than Starlink on the satellite side, or we compete, but is this the right approach? We doubt that. We believe that the advantage lays in a kind of network orchestration layer. We believe what is happening in the content world is happening in the network work as well. So the one who is able to orchestrate different technologies, infrastructures they might not own, but provide it to the end customers. These are the ones who are succeeding prospectively. So the network orchestrator is the one who is winning in this field. But this sounds easy, but from a technical perspective, it's very complicated. How can you organize a satellite into a mobile network or into a fixed line infrastructure? How can you um, um, build it? How can you organize the quality of service? All the things I laid out further. So, we have to see who is first on building the network of networks. Who is first to enable this software layer? We have a super advantage because we have accomplished our IP migration, so these services already are able to be steered in a software world, but there are new infrastructures which we will not own, which we have to embrace and integrate into our ecosystem. With this, we have a bigger reach. With this, we have a bigger market. And with the bigger market, we have a bigger potential to sell our products towards the customer. And on top of that, the question is how we embrace communication services like Cisco, like Apple, like Microsoft into our infrastructure. We do not want to develop that on our own. We want to build strategic partnerships, but we have to build the APIs, the interfaces to these services in the right manner. The telco industry will go from a monolithic incumbent to an orchestrator to a network of networks. And my last thing is the software layer which is enabling the services. 
services. And Claudia will talk about that in more detail because we are already on that journey. You have again this infrastructure which I laid out on the previous chart. And I said there is this element of the orchestration which we have and which we have to organize in a cloud native, in a kind of software driven environment. But on top of that, we need tools who are making the service intelligent, unified data and analytic engine services. Product services and development take the home OS environment, which is easily connected to the different infrastructures. Embedded security, as I have laid it out, and platform-based services, which are needed to build customers, to identify customers, to authorize customers and the like. This is the world which we have to build. We have to build telco as a platform service. This is the next evolution after the IP migration. And that is something which I'm expecting from the Netcos to do this in a consolidated, in a synergistic way uh, that we can scale. On top of that, microservices and APIs enable the customer use cases, because we will not develop the use cases our own. Some may be, but most of them are developed in the ecosystem um, of the over the tops. This is why they're called over the tops. And this is something um, where we have to make sure that it's easy to connect. It's another form of the Steckerleiste. Maybe some of you remind the story, the plugin which we had already in earlier strategies. So this is our 2030 view. This is, let's say, a thing which we, which we should think about. We should not do some step after another. We should have an orientation. We should have a lighthouse in which this industry might go and where we position ourselves already today. And that is our strategy today. This is what we foresee as paradigms for 2030. And this is what we do now to get there. So, the headlines of all presentations of my colleagues are around from connectivity to customer experience by making and turning customers into fans, creating experience around products and services which are unique. From dedicated to software-driven enterprise solutions, we want to become the digital enabler for our B2B customers on their needs which they have in collaboration and communication in IoT and in the cloud space. People, society, from ESG as a hydrant factor to ESG as a differentiator. Green magenta and good magenta, our ethical expectations. Networks from monolithic incumbent to a network of orchestrator. We build, orchestrate, and differentiate. This is already something where our architectural um, uh, logic um, is working on. And digitization from vertical solutions to telco as a platform to cloud native API envi environmental. The prerequisite for this is we digitize and digitize and digitize everything what we have. So wherever we can digitize, we should do that because this will enable, this will enable a cloud native API based architecture, which we foresee for the long term future. So coming into the commitments and coming into the next years, the next three years, um, what we want to achieve. And we will have deep dives on each of these topics. So let me quickly go through that. We want to play our differentiation in the convergence piece in Europe. We are strong at that. And we foresee that the FMC penetration in our customer base has a big opportunity uh, to gain more momentum. Best connectivity experience, embracing other technologies, seamless interplay between them, and innovations beyond the core for the services is one thing. Best mobile experience, we always want to have the best infrastructure on mobile. And differentiated service, we want to increase, as an example, our first call contact resolution from 55 to more than 62% in Germany. And by the way, we are not talking about idle times. We are not talking about call handling times. We are not talking about deadline compliance. We just talk about the way, solve the issue for the customers. And we're doing that already today, stealing with pride from the US, which is called the techs, the team of experts, um, which is now embedded and implemented across all the operations um, uh, we are running. 
a personalized offline and digital service, first time right, and very much about Heimvernetzung, the connectivity at home, which will enable a seamless and uh, uh, interruptible free service. Our commitment, 10 million households in FMC. Our commitment, industry-leading growth in branded post-bed customers. We want to win market share in this regard. Extended all-time high customer satisfaction. We want to increase our customer satisfaction, our net promoter scores beyond the level which we have already achieved in all areas where we're operating and re the brand um, under the idea of digital optimism, believing into a future which is getting better through our services. Coming to the B2B. On the B2B, we see two big paradigm shifts short term. The first one is the SD-WAN um, uh, development from MPLS, dedicated lines to an SD-WAN service, which is more flexible, more affordable for our clients and customers. And we see a growth of 36% in this environment. And we see this enterprise communication and collaboration where we see huge tailwind um, where end customers are spending a lot. The hybrid way of working is, is the way of the future and the ECC is the tool which is enabling this. This is what we're working on. Enterprise networks, IoT and security solutions, cloud and digital. And our commitment going forward is we're going to see a CAGA growth of 2% in the B2B, Sarah. I'm very irritated when I see all my telecommunication players around me always you know, talk about negatives. They're all shrinking in that environment. We are growing. We are growing already today. And we believe we can grow at least with a CAGA of 2% in this environment in Germany and in Europe. US? we will double. We will double our B2B uh, market share from 10% to 20% because we have the credibility, because we have for the first time a better network than AT&T and Verizon at affordable prices and this makes us strong to gain market share of these guys. We will double our IoT revenues and even our APU in this area, a big enabler. And I can talk about hundreds of thousands of SIM cards, which we recently gained with car manufacturers and the like, which is enabling IoT connectivity to cars. By the way, the chipset shortage is something which is good for us because every chipset is producing data which has to get allocated in the infrastructure. So therefore, we are in the play. In public cloud, we are expecting that our public cloud servicing is growing by 50%. Coming to the field of um, ESG. And um, I think we can skip directly to the slide. It's not working. Go ahead. We can go to the slide. We have built a new team, a stronger team for all the ESG topics which we have. And we even have created a new ambition level for our ESG targets. The first thing is 100% of electricity from coming from renewables already this year. So every kind of energy we are using in our footprint is already today on 100% renewable energy. This is already, I think, a big step, and it costs us millions, double million, digit millions, to get there. But I think it's worth doing it to have a green network. Now the next step, which is new. On scope one and two, we want to, let's say, have a net zero own emission by 2025. Now you might question, what are you talking? This is electricity, but we still have a fleet. We still have buildings who are consuming energy um, uh, in this regard, oil and other things. And we are now working how we can reduce even this emission to zero. So that's the, that's the scope and our commitments toward 2025. And then we have up and downstream energy consumption, the way how our technology is getting produced, handsets, routers, all this kind of stuff. And we have the end customers consuming all the products of Deutsche Telekom. We want to make sure that the net zero emission is achieved through this value chain 
at least by 2040, which is at least significantly ahead about, let's say, taxonomy and the targets of the European Commission and others. This is the scope three where we're working on. Third, increase in, energy, in, the, in the energy efficiency in our network. Every single discussion should be not only saying, by the way, we help you to reduce your energy consumption. We should even think about how we can gain productivity in the way how we are consuming uh, energy um, uh, in this environment. And Claudia will talk about how she can do this in the technology field later on. Maintain an all-time high customer and um, uh, employee satisfaction. Our people should be proud. Our people should have a purpose. Our sh people should understand why they're working every day for Deutsche Telekom. And we have a big purpose, as I have laid it out already. We are the enabler for future growth. And therefore, we should keep this momentum that people are proud about the T, proud about Magenta, proud about what we are doing. And therefore, having almost 90% of the people being committed, I think this is unique if I see the benchmark of other industries. And then on top of that, we have uh, ESG initiatives in the recycling field. And we have said every board member, prospectively, short-term perspectively, every leader of this company should have ESG target in his long-term incentive scheme. So it's not only that we are committing to something, we will be paid by the fulfillment of our ESG targets, which I'm just describing. And the last thing is, apart from the green magenta initiatives, we have a good magenta initiatives. Good magenta is, what are we doing about digital literacy? What are we doing about democratic values in a digital society? What are we doing about hate speech? What are we doing about all these escalations which are taking place around us with regard to fake news, um, deep fakes and other things. We are fighting them and we want to stand as a voice in this circumstance. We are by far the leading European telco and therefore we have a duty um, to tackle these issues. And we just launched a campaign together with Billie Eilish, which was seen 340 million times on the internet from the next generation. So it has already impact, but this is definitely not a um, uh, 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 one se session issue, it will be a campaign um, uh, which we are going to create even beyond today. That brings me to the core of the core, our network. And what you see here is today we have, um, uh, as an example, our fiber situation in Germany. 5% is our FTTH position, 83 is FTTC, and then we have still some ADSL. We have 100% more or less ownership of this kind of services. We're going to change that, and we're in the middle of this transformation. 60, 70% of the infrastructure we will own, and it will be fiber. We have made a clear commitment that we are now developing a significant acceleration on the Filber build out in Germany. We had 600,000 last year. This year we're going to 1.3, 1.4 million. The year after to 2.1, and then we go to 2.5 million households on an annual basis as a run rate of the infrastructure. This is what we do as owners of the infrastructure. There will be as well external money going into networks, which we embrace, hold by, which is extending our footprint uh, beyond uh, where we are today. On reciprocal terms, reciprocity is the name of the game. Why should we overbuild somebody if they have built already fiber? Why can't we embrace them into our infrastructure? So third party will help us to have a big footprint. And you see, we will keep our retail market share. We will keep the same position as we have it today at least. The commitment which we are giving is Germany, we will quadruple the fiber to the home output. We will attack. We will not be only in the, in the outskirts. We will not be there where only subsidized monies are available. We have announced Berlin, Düsseldorf, Hamburg, Frankfurt already. I would love to see us being strong in Munich as well. 
uh, because that's a market where we want to, let's say, play a significantly role in the city. So there are other markets to come soon. We will have um, additional footprint in Europe. Today, Europe is already at a run rate of 1.1 million fiber households on an annual basis. So we want to keep that, even accelerate this output effort that we are the leading fiber core in Europe. That's definitely our ambition. And therefore, we have allocated money to this one. It's highly profitable because it's easier, it's cheaper to build an FTTH structure in these regions. And this will bring us to an outstanding leadership position, not only on fiber, but as well on the 5G area. I don't want to repeat that, you know that. There's no question, no question. Deutsche Telekom will always lead the mobile space. This is our ambition. We will win every network test. And by the way, just this morning, uh, OpenSignal published uh, their test. We have a 30% advantage to our follower, which is Vodafone. Um, we are really, let's say, ahead of our competition. I'm very proud about our technicians who make that possible and in the financial envelope, which we have laid out. By the end of this year, we will have 90% um, 5G coverage already in Germany. Um, so that shows you the advantage of what we have created in this environment. And the US, I think you know the story and Mike will talk about that one as well later. Which brings me already to the end, um, which is a very important piece. Digitize, digitize, digitize. I always say to the company, if you do not understand the strategy, if you do not know what to do, if you do not have a leader who tells you what to do, digitize. Because there is always a place where we can uh, improve. Three areas of digitization. Customer frontline. Boost the e-sales and the digital reach. We want to have one unique app with a high usage. Service automation and remote provisioning. We are running the biggest bot farm in telco industries. 3,000 bots operating in our network already today. Including predictive and productive maintenance because the more proactive we are, the less complaints, the less costs we are creating in the system. Network in IT. Digitize, digitize, digitize. The way of open run, the disaggregation of our network. So um, the, the way of running network from a software uh, perspective than rather having it in a very uh, decentralized way is the next thing. And this in a kind of agile and cloud native IT. Our IT has significantly improved over the last years. Um, the time to market has come down to numbers which were even not close to our expectation when we had the last capital markets day. And then we have the operations. Everything internally has to get flattenized. Everything has to get automized in a way. We should not bother our people with routines which we can softwareize. And therefore, there's a big boost for internal efficiency via digitization, and we commit to another 1.2 billion of savings in the organization here in Europe um, for, uh, for further uh, productivity gains. The ambitions, 30% e-sales shares, 25 to 30% e-sales shares in Europe, two months time to market in Germany and one month's time to market in Europe, which makes us much more flexible, much quicker in responding to our competition and even our testing um, of new um, products is easier to handle. This is the last thing on the portfolio, the capital allocation. We want to achieve transatlantic leadership by creating more synergies in our footprint. Due to the fact that everything is going in software, we can jointly work much better together. And we're doing that already today. Take our TV platform, which is now harmonized around the whole European footprint. Think about the mesh router and the router development. It's harmonized around Europe and beyond that. So we have a lot of areas where we can harmonize and where we can generate synergies within the footprint of the biggest telco in the Western Hemisphere. Being in AAA market is by definition an advantage. 
we have one regulatory or more less harmonized regulatory environment with less risks, which helps us a lot. Number one in Europe and soon number one in the US. This is our ambition rate. This is leading. Build once and scale. I made that already. And the one app is another example on how we are driving it. Um, we have just, you know, joined and integrated the team on this airfield that this development is just taking place out of one hand. And a repeatable playbook. Leverage the best practice around the footprint. And this is not only for operations. It's as well in the way how we do portfolio and M&A. Always trying opportunities. We, are, we, are, we don't say we are selling and we are buying. We are even you know, trying to do forms outside of the balance sheet. We are trying to do things that we have maybe even minority shareholders in some areas to create upsides at a later stage. And that is the way how we are driving things. Um, and uh, this repeatable playbook, which we have learned, um, is even stronger because we have one single business model uh, in our in our organization. The commitment, we want to increase our return on capital employed for the German operation by 50%. We want to double the B2B market share um, in the US. We want to scale the one app beyond um, all the footprint and we want to have 80% of the router base um, with an own operating system. By the way, even the home OS, which we are developing, which is bringing all the home services together, is something which we are launching soon. So more to come on the product events. So this was my journey, um, you know, in a nutshell about what we are doing. Um, we are very, very ambitious in how we see the future. And the headline, as I said, it is acceleration. Acceleration. Revenues. One to two percent. Okay, you know that number, but nobody's interested about revenues from handsets. Service revenue matters. The utilization of the infrastructure matters. Three to four percent growth. So we believe in a significant growth on the service revenue side. EBITDA, the group is going to grow by three to five percent. This is two percent more than what we said last time. Adjusted EBITDA grows by 5 to 6%. This is significantly more than what we said last time. Free cash flow today, 8 billion, 24 beyond 18 billion. Another 10 billion um, in the year 24 on the cash flow, uh, which we are generating today. And XUS, we're going to bring it to the 4 billion here. Adjusted EPS, we go to 1 euro 75 and the ROSI should be beyond 6.5%. The CapEx envelope is defined. XUS 8.2 billion is the vicinity on how um, we are investing. And indirect costs should get reduced by 1.2 billion. The shareholder remuneration based on the EPS with a payout ratio of 40 to 60%, which gives a perspective to grow our dividend significantly over the next years. Look, I think Dutch Telecom is not an accident. The strategy is something which we work very hard on it. Uh, it is supported from 250,000 people in this organization. Um, I commit that we, again, will deliver of what we have promised. We see the future as a growth future. We see us positioned very well from a portfolio and the markets we are operating. We have a differentiator, which is around our infrastructure. We have an idea about how we are developing this company towards a new layout for the generation 2030. And with this, I'm very optimistic that we will create more value than the other telcos. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Tim. Um, thanks for this great, um, for setting this framework for us. Maybe you can join me now for the Q&A. Um, we don't have too much time for the Q&A now, but we have Tim back on stage tomorrow after the last session. So um, let's have a couple of questions right now. I can see already Polo 
uh, Polo Tang from UBS uh, there on uh, the WebEx. So, Polo, maybe we start with you. Can we have your question, please? Yeah, hi. Um, thanks for taking the question. Thanks for the very upbeat uh, presentation. Um, so I have one question, uh, which is just on shareholder returns and the $60 billion buyback at T-Mobile US. So it's very clear that you want to get to a 50% shareholding in T-Mobile US. But once you reach a 50% shareholding, are you likely to participate uh, in the T-Mobile US buyback program? And if so, uh, what would you do with the proceeds? Okay, Paulo, thank you. Um, the first thing is, you know, first step after the second, you know. So um, the first step is we have a big commitment towards our build-out program in Germany on fiber and, and um, on 5G. Uh, on top of that, we want to achieve this, um, this majority position, um, and we haven't taken any decision on whether we will take uh, part of that program or not. I would, I would expect us having a 50% plus position that we then um, will more think about how we can do the allocation of that money, whether we, we do the debt reduction or other things. Um, I, I would not see us immediately, let's say, participating and extending it. I do not see an immediate value out of that, um, uh, but that would be my spontaneous reaction of today. Um, um, so um, now taking first 51 and then um, um, uh, letting letting the whole equation um, uh, uh, being, being um, um, uh, reviewed again. Okay, Very thanks. good. Thank you, uh, Polo. And so the next uh, question, oh, I can Getting see you, to. Andrew, uh, at uh, Goldman. So hi, Andrew, from the trading floor, I can see. <laughs> That's good. Uh, okay, so uh, can we have your question, please? Yeah, uh, hi, hi, Tim. Um, it's great to see your uh, rocky targets today, uh, which ultimately come down to growth and costs. Um, when we saw you in Bonn a couple of years ago, the main question mark on that was probably on sustainable growth. And it's actually you know, it's, it's an upbeat thing to hear about a telco talking about growth. You've since delivered on that nicely, and your guidance from here is more credible as a result. But right now, um, there's a heightened uncertainty in the sector um, on what you described as the investment you put into the will. And so I wondered if you could t talk a bit more about how much visibility and certainty you have on CapEx intensity and also how you flex for the spectrum that fits into that, just to give us some confidence that we don't get a CapEx warning over the next couple of years like we've seen uh, across the space over the past few weeks and months. Thank you. I, th I think the uncertainty at the less capital market was significantly higher than it is today. Um, last time we had the unclear position on the US. Last time we were not clear how to do play the 4G game and extend our footprint to uh, where we are today. Um, last time um, we had this big um, auctions uh, AWS in front of us in the US. Um, last time um, we had just the announcement around the Vodafone uh, integration of fixed line and mobile services here in Germany and, and the competitive challenges uh, we were facing. Last time we had portfolio assets um, which were not running um, operationally uh, well, uh, like the Netherlands. Um, so um, today, I can tell you I'm sitting in a portfolio which is more or less fixed in, in every regard. We're still working on two systems. We can talk about that. But um, from a total equation, that is, um, for me, from, a, from, a, from an outlook perspective, the most uncertain one, because I do not know how these markets are recovering after COVID and how much of this, uh, how much of a, the, we are participating in that growth. But that said, um, I'm, I, I see that. The second one is I do not see super significant auctions coming. Um, we always had this kind of um, buckets in our planning um, and anticipating big auctions. Um, this time, looking to this one, it's much more foreseeable what's coming. This is millimeter wave bands which are coming. Um, there are some European markets with 5G services coming which are not that big. Um, I do not see significant big auctions uh, on the horizon which will, which will eat up into our balance sheet. And on top of that, our position, think about our position in the US. You know, we are ahead of our competition with 5G services and build out. We have a very clear view that how we, what we need as CapEx to stay ahead and what is, what is needed there in the market environment. Um, so look, I, I, I'm, I'm very confident um, um, uh, to the German build out because what we have changed is, and by the way, this is even a regulatory approach. You look, in the past, people were saying, we won't expect that you build a new monopoly. We don't. You know, we will make safe that, you know, we will protect our market share, at least, they said that. 
we will have a decent share of wholesale um, because the deals are already made in the vicinity of 17 billion for Germany as an example. So we have a decent wholesale share on top of that one. But, you know, we will not build the whole country. So there will be others doing it. So why should I overbuild others if these guys are opening up their infrastructure to us and we can sell Magenta services um, um, as well in these regions? This is the way going forward. And that keeps me more relaxed than this attitude of saying we always in the fixed line business have to own a monopoly for the whole country. So I think this is a new learning that we do not have to own whole infrastructure. We have to own the majority, you know, and the argument is it 60, is it 70? This is, let's say, the pitch which we are doing. That just gives us credibility. But beyond that, we will have a lot of whole by deals. And therefore, we are limited on this exposure. Um, I, I think it's even a capacity issue. Building now 2.5 million households in Germany, uh, this is a big stretch target for an organization and even for our external service um, uh, partners. Um, so therefore, look, I'm maybe, you know, um, I'm too optimistic. Um, challenge me on this one. But uh, for me, the perspective is more easier to take than it was, you know, four years ago. And that is why we gave you higher numbers. On top of that, we have a better control about the fixed line market in Germany. Uh, you see our market share beyond 50% on the net ad side. We have no line losses anymore. So even the constant revenue stream we are getting out of this, the growth is, was around five-ish already, is something which, which gives me confidence that, um, that we are well positioned. Great. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Tim. And oh, I can see Akhil um, not at the trading floor, uh, it looks like. And um, Akhil, um, can we have your question? And then we have one more and then we move on to 3D. OK, so Akhil. Yeah, great. Thanks very much. It's two very quick ones, hopefully. So one is on towers. Tim, you mentioned, as you have before, that you see yourself as the kingmaker when it comes to towers. Um, I just wondered, with the strategic review you're talking about, whether that changes the options you're thinking about. I think in the past you've said you are ruling out an IPO, you are ruling out a disposal. It was more trying to find ways to create incremental value. If you could just maybe talk through whether there are other options now, whether you're thinking around that's changed. So that's the first one. And then the second one is you've talked a lot about the network of networks and this aggregator strategy as Deutsche Telekom going forward. Um, how important is scale to that? And when you think about Europe, which remains very fragmented, do you think that that means that as this industry evolves, scale is incrementally important? And do you think cross-border consolidation therefore becomes more important too? Thank you. Very good. Um, look, the first thing is um, we have been at the forefront of carving out our towers. And we have, I think, over the last years, very much professionalized the operations in Europe on the tower side. and. Uh, we have increased our EBITDA just from my mind, 150 million, you know, on top of that. So not going to the market with a low performance, but having already, let's say, taking the low hanging fruits on the services, which will give us a better value. We have seen that, you know, even the, the market contributes, I think it was six or eight mil billion. Now it's around 12 billion value to this, to this thing. So they see this value enhancing. We have seen that the Americans have, you know, uh, positioned them themselves into the European space as well. We have seen Celnex, you know, scaling up their business. So we saw the multiples uh, between US and Europe coming very similar. And on top of that, where we see that everybody's positioned themselves to become an industry leader in this in this space. So we saw high multiples beyond 30 on this uh, on this businesses. And we don't believe that this business, this multiples are going now uh, significantly uh, um, higher uh, on this one. So now now it's the right timing to think about to play in this game, because the fantasy of something organically is more limited. So we have now an asset on hand we can play with. We can consider selling the majority. We can sell in a piece. Look, I want to I wanna send Langheim out there and, and, and come home with a, with a fantastic deal. Uh, I'm open to every option, to be honest, open to every option. Um, but it has to be a good deal. It has to be a fat and, and juicy deal for Deutsche Telekom. And that is why I think it's now the right timing where everybody's positioned and nobody's talking about theory. These companies are now built and they are, the players are there and there was never so much money in the market. So I think this is now the right thing. Look, um, 
Um, I hope that we can come soon coming back to you guys and, and show that, that, that we're doing the right uh, deals here. Torsten will talk about that one in more detail um, uh, later on, but that is at least the strategic uh, topic. Network of networks, thank you for, for because guys, I, I think we have to think about the future. Because otherwise we will not understand, you know, um, uh, that the companies, uh, telco companies are long-term uh, positioned. So the network of networks and the aggregator strategy is something you have to invest, you have to learn, you have to collaborate with uh, hyperscalers in this case. Um, so the, are there enemies, are there frenemies, what role do they play? This is, this is the thing where, where we have now to start working on and uh, and scale is important because the bigger the aggregator is the better the economy scales gets in this ecosystem the more you know your incremental cost of it in investments are getting lower and therefore i think it's important but you know who is better positioned in europe than deutsche telecom now compared to the us compared to to, to asia we are subscale and therefore i'm calling desperately calling as a European citizen for a s harmonization for a single market of Europe. We need it to survive. We need it to play a, a relevant role in this piece prospectively. So I'm not driving politics. Uh, I, I know that the single market is still far away. I'm calling for bigger consolidation, but Deutsche Telekom is not sitting here and willing to invest cash into buying a company and then integrating it. That is not what we are looking for. Uh, but I hope that this market is coming into consolidation, that we are creating um, um, 200, 300 billion pounders here who are able to create the same economies of scale uh, like other markets. Uh, but this is a way, you know, which is very difficult to predict. Um, um, and w perspectively with the software development, the cross-border consolidation maybe gets, you know, more juicy um, because you have better uh, economies. Um, look, um, at that point in time, I can only tell you um, there's no um, activity in this regard. Um, Europe is on, on a little bit on a way in this network issue to get, become more nationalistic. Um, due to all the discussions we have in the political landscape, uh, but perspectively, we need a single market for Europe. I cry for that. Thanks, Tim. Thank That's very good. I mean, we, we, um, we are very short of time now. So, um, Usman, uh, great to see you. Um, have a, let's have a, a quick question and, and a quick answer, maybe, uh, so we can have time for Germany and, and, and the other subjects as well. Thank you, Usman. Good to see you. Great. Hi, hi guys. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, it, it was just going back to the, uh, the strategic question of uh, telco relationship with hyperscalers. Um, this particularly in light of the uh, you know the, the deal that Dish is doing with um, with Amazon in the U.S. So, is it, you know, from your overview, I mean, it's clear that more and more of uh, telco kind of network data will be running on cloud servers, uh, hyperscaler servers. Uh, you know, more of the network will be run as software, uh, um, again, you know, uh, on, on commoditized kind of hardware. Um, through network slicing, I guess you have a situation where, you know, hyperscalers can, in theory, you know, run telco networks dire directly into, um, into customer premises. Uh, so, so the question was really, I mean, how, how are you, uh, you know, as an organization managing the potential disintermediation risk? Um, and, you know, to, to what extent does the telco kind of connectivity model need to change in order to, you know, be able to get more upside from this relationship with hyperscalers and not to be reduced down to just providers of commodity who are uh, connectivity who are just, you know, priced down all the time. Um, Thanks. Look, um, thank you very much for that good question here. Um, it's at the core, and, and I, I have to be now qu fast, <laughs> the very complex question. Now, the thing is, um, you know, you have to manage your dependencies and there's one dependencies, the hyperscalers will not go away. And there will be definitely, let's say, a service which they're providing and where we can, where we, where we can benefit from. We have to bring the physical connectivity and the logical f connectivity. We have to bring that together. This is how we make services um, um, and quality of service for customers available. This is, I think, the logic. Therefore, we need hyperscalers, perspectively. 
Now, the question is, we should not become dependent on, hype, on one hyperscaler. So this multi-cloud approach is one of the solutions that you're not relying only on one um, uh, hyperscaler in the way how you cloudify your infrastructure. The second thing is, um, look the car industry. The car industry is embracing big time Amazon and, uh, and, uh, and Microsoft to their services, but they're not losing value chain. They take them as a, as a service provider. And this is the way how we think as well about it. We are not building the cloud ourselves. We are not running it. Um, there will be critical pieces which we have to control ourselves. There will be pieces of the network where we leverage our network. Think the housing of edge clouds. I can believe that we do that with hyperscalers together. And then there will be pieces of it. I think the value for us is in the centerpiece which we're having. On the other, on the one side, orchestration infrastructures from us and others. And on the other side, having always the access to 260 million customers in our footprint directly, including our B2C relations and B2B relations. And for me, the hyperscalers can enable our services, which I laid out earlier, quality of service, different uh, um, uh, carrier grades and the like, in a kind of intelligent way. I do not see them that they really substitute us. I think they will help us to enable this orchestration and the cloud native approach of our infrastructure and we will select not only one we will work with different players together that's the way how we how i see the future going forward but claudia will talk about that tomorrow hopefully for you in a more clearer way um, that is the way which i want to drive you cannot just ignore them you have to embrace them and that is why dish and amazon are working together in the us and uh, i think uh, rakuten uh, is on the on the same journey and um, so therefore uh, we should adapt that yes thank you tim if you can't beat them join them but thanks for this great uh, uh, framework and you know as you can see the idea of today is we won't rest on our laurels on the contrary we will accelerate